be more obvious sound. There's a huge edge to be gained by looking into things like this. With the hype, it's only going one way. He's still too cheap. How can you not love fantasy football? Okay, welcome back into the Fantasy Sanctuary. This is the second in a three-part series going round by round, looking at which players were good in best ball ADP, which rounds were bad, which rounds were good, and what we can take away from that process before we spin forward and start these 2023 drafts. With me today is Kyle Dvorak of Rotor World NBC. I mean, you must have seen Kyle's work. He's been around on so many different sites, a whole host of great platforms, and his podcast with Pat Doherty is one of the funniest ones which you can listen to and a real highlight every week of my listening. Kyle, how are you doing? Doing well. The season uh, in terms of workload, we're pretty much at an end. We're at a reasonable end. So uh, I have some time to do stuff like this as opposed to keep grinding as hard. Well, that's it. I'm diving in and getting people on now before everyone gets on the holidays and uh, forgets what happened in 2022. But let's get into it. So first off, round seven, this was Joe Burrow, Amari Cooper, Josh Jacobs, DeAndre Hopkins, Devonta Smith, Christian Kirk, Russell Wilson, Tony Pollard, Chase Edmonds, Kadarius Tony, Clyde Edwards Hilaire and Hunter Renfro. And really, this round is kind of the tale of two halves. You can see here with the advance rates, which are kind of, kind of handy to look at. There's a sea of green at the top and then a sea of red at the back half of it. There were some really good players and then there were some really bad players. And that carried over into fantasy points over expected, where, again, we had some real stinkers. And yes, we're talking about you, Russell Wilson. But this conversation feels like we should be starting with Josh Jacobs, who if you were drafting a lot of Josh Jacobs in round seven, there was a really good chance that you advanced an awful lot of best ball teams in 2022. He was just incredible. He was the RB3 overall, almost 100 yards per game. Cal, did you see this coming for Josh Jacobs or were you like the masses and fading him and really just felt like it couldn't happen for him? Yeah, I had like next to none of Jacobs before like the final ADP plunge, at which point like I think I should have been even, uh, I mean, it's easy to say in hindsight, I think I should have been even uh, more price sensitive in that like obviously when if his price were to go up i would continue to not draft him but i should have been even more willing to draft him as his price went down because his backfield competition was so weak the raiders projected to have a good if not really good it didn't end up being that way but they were like i think like dead even like 15th in scoring so a good slightly above average offense could have been even better backfield competition was weak so i, I thought once the once the price corrected so hard in the final like two weeks of the summer i started getting some josh jacobs but his price plummeted like almost from the day we started drafting it just never really went up it just kept going down and down and by like god imagine july should have been at least a reasonable time to start taking him and said it was like the 11th hour uh on the clock and i'm like oh i guess it's time to get a little bit of him a little bit of dave montgomery these types of uh of backs but also he's been pretty talented throughout his career i don't think he's quite i mean it's pretty hard from like a real life perspective to put up first round running back value. Like that's just the way the position is. He hasn't quite lived up to that, but he's had a pretty strong career so far. He's been a pretty efficient running back at times. So, and he's shown the ability to catch passes, even if they generally didn't use him that way. We saw that a little bit last year during the first half in the Gruden era, they actually were like pretty comfortable using him as a pass catcher for the first time in his career. So we knew he had the potential to put it all together. And I think maybe like, I don't think he was like, it wasn't easy to see in hindsight. I think there were indicators, but like, did he did he lead the league in rushing? I think, I kind of think he did. Uh, yeah, I think he did. Yeah, and it was, and just going back to what you were saying, like looking at this round in particular, you know, in hindsight, the choice between him and Chase Edmonds, it felt like Chase Edmonds was the young up and comer. He'd just been paid, and you know, we were all chasing money. It was like you don't pay a running back that much money and not use him. And Jacobs and, had been not paid. They chose not to pick up his fifth year option too. So he had like the opposite effect going for him. Exactly. And like the Jacobs truthers will tell you that this was just always coming and that the talent had always been there since college. But I don't think that there are any positive signs that we could have pointed to. Whereas perhaps our next guy, Tony Pollard, if you're a zero RB fan or even a hero RB fan or just a fan of good running backs, then you've probably been on a Tony Pollard at some point. And it felt like this year we finally got all the payoff for talking him up for years. You know, he was the RB7 overall, 4.0 fantasy points over expected per game, 17 big runs, which is the third most at running backs. And it just felt like nobody wanted to draft Zeke Elliott last year, but Tony Pollard, he didn't 
quite get priced for his breakout if this was the breakout that we were expecting. There's not really too much to glean about that situation now, but if Tony Pollard ends up back in Dallas next year, do you think that the ADPs are going to flip so we'll see round four Tony Pollard and round seven Zeke, or do you think it'll be more extreme? I think it might be more extreme. People love Tony Pollard. Like he was, he was going, think about how many touches, like he exceeded his touch expectation by a wide margin. Like la- like last year, as in 2021, I think Zeke missed, I, I think he missed no games, right? And Tony Pollard had 63 fewer carries, uh, like the same amount of receptions on fewer targets. Not much change this year. Zeke was not good in 2021. It was not good in 2022. Zeke missed one or two games last year and none, I think, two years ago. Like, there wasn't much in terms of how much we could project him to get touches uh, differently that changed. The only thing that changed was Dallas sort of capitulated, but really, like, they didn't really, right? The, the capitulating to the Tony Pollard truthers would be to find out if he can handle 22 carries and six targets a game. That would actually be the smart thing to do. Or if that's not the case, if, if you think there's no way as a team, like if the Dallas coaches think he just physically cannot hold up to it, just use throw the ball more, use Zeke less, get Tony Pollard in space targeted more because targets are less likely to turn into like between the tackles, like brutal head on head collisions. Like there were so many ways they could have actually taken more advantage of Pollard. And the fact that they didn't shows us that they did not even want to give Pollard like this level of role. Like this was the max he had. And he ran Like, he's really good. So I think we can project him to be better than average running back in average situation type of player. But on 193 carries, he topped 1,000 yards and scored nine times. He was elite on a yards per target, which isn't in yards per hour. Like, he was really good in all efficiency metrics. Scored three times and averaged, like, 10 yards per catch. Like, you could have gotten Josh Jacobs, who was getting, like, he had a stretch where he was averaging, like, 33 touches a game in the same round as Tony Pollard. And I love Tony Pollard. But, like, we are really going to give him a lot of credit for efficiency next year. I am sure of it. And I think he's good and should be efficient over the long run. Do I think, like, we're probably going to overstep our bounds because we think he's, like, the best running back in the league, which he, like, by some metrics he kind of is. But he'll never get the touches to replicate that volume that someone like McCaffrey has. I I think he ran good to outproduce his ADP as much as he did this past season and we're really going to price him up because of that. I I think it's going to be like a round three, round nine to 10 plus split. Yeah. I think one of the things that kind of kept his ADP as low as it was in round seven was the fact that people believe that Zeke would get so much goal line work that he would be hoovering up so many touchdowns. We saw with Pollard, he had 12 touchdowns, which was fourth fourth most at running back. And he really did pay off. Another player who was kind of kept down by his teammate and the value that might have been there was Devonta Smith, who when AJ Brown came into town, obviously everybody just believed that everything was going to go to AJ Brown, possibly some to Dallas Goddard. And it would have been very hard for Devonta Smith to really reach his ceiling outcome. But he had five top 12 weeks, 88 catches, which was ninth most at wide receiver, over a thousand yards. And he was the wide receiver nine in total points. How early is too early to draft Devonta Smith next year if round seven was too late this year? Yeah, I, for me, uh, like last year, I ended up having a decent amount of Devonta Smith because I feel more comfortable. Like, I, I love Pollard. Like, I've been taking Pollard every single year he's been in the leagues. Every year, it's like, Sky looks great. Zeke is dwindling. By like year two, it's very clear Zeke was dwindling. They're going to give him the work eventually. But there's only so much like an individual running back can do to create a role for themselves. Whereas like just by the nature of the position, the fact that moving the ball through the air is more efficiently, like the better a receiver is, the literal more plays he can give his team, right? He gets first downs, he moves the chains, like he creates more yards per target than any running back does, like if he's a good receiver, right? So I'm more willing to uh, like, except the mouths to feed argument in a backfield in which like Tony Pollard, despite being maybe the best running back in the league, couldn't earn more than a committee role because he's not like he's producing five yards, six yards every time he touches the ball. Whereas like Devonta Smith is so much better than that. So uh, in general, if I believe in the talent of a receiver, I'm more willing to say like, yeah, they will just make a role for themselves. So even though uh, I like AJ Brown's incredible and it's just this massive target hog, like, 
receivers and tight ends to a degree, uh, at least more so than running backs by a significant margin, I'm willing to say like, yeah, I don't see at this moment how to give them a 20 X percent target share, but like, they can push that because they are uh, talented where like running back to position is just so much different. So I think it is totally fine to have him as like a third, fourth round pick somewhere on that three, four turn. What he's going to be like, I assume like 24 or five years old coming off of a wide receiver one season on an offense that was elite last year. So. Yeah. I I think also uh, I've already started hearing people say that the Eagles don't want to pass as much and stuff, but Next year, they're going to face a first-place schedule, and I think that can possibly put them in more positions where they do have to throw a lot. We saw it at times this year. They just didn't need to run, didn't need to throw the ball as much. There were games which Jalen Hurts missed as well, and uh, I don't believe we've seen the highest possible outcome for this offense yet. I'd like to believe there's another level they can take. Yeah, Eagles Uh, don't want to pass... uh seems like almost nonsense. Like they were like, I think they are willing to run on their opponents when their opponents will let them do that. Like that is uh, reasonable and it is what they have shown to do. But when they faced a team, like they faced Pittsburgh before they even got TJ Watt back, they just sat back and nuked Pittsburgh through the air. Like when you can get easy one-on-one matchups with mediocre corners, no pressure, this was the same way they did this against the bears too, where they just let Jalen hurts, drop back like clean like three five step drop back and heave it they're really good at adapting to what their opponents are going to let them do and at times that does mean they'll run a run first script but i don't think they are philosophically committed to the run in any way like we saw this time and time again they're totally fine blasting you through the air if you're going to give that to them and they're really good so giving it to them is is easy in the sense of a lot of teams are not talented enough at corner cannot generate the pressure because they have a great offensive line too to keep up with the Eagles, right? So a lot of teams, just because they don't have the talent on defense, are going to be able to be beaten through the air. And we saw them do it. So I I think it's like nonsense that they don't want to throw the ball. Okay, let's move on to round eight. So this round was Ramondre Stevenson, Chris Olave, Tom Brady, Dallas Goddard, Sky Moore, Damian Pierce, Dak Prescott, Miles Sanders, TJ Hawkinson, Rashad Penny, Marcus Valdez, Scantling, and Kareem Hunt. There's a lot of bad in this round, and neither of the quarterbacks helped you here. Dak Prescott and Tom Brady both had negative advance rates, and Brady regressed massively. Dak missed games. And you can see in these advance rates that there was a bunch of running backs who didn't really do an awful lot as well. But here we go in fantasy points over expected again. There's some really heavy red there, which is not what you want to be seeing. This is a round where you want to be finding breakout players rather than players who are holding you down. And the one breakout player who really did succeed was Ramondre Stevenson, who, much like Josh Jacobs, was a real league winner. RB9 in total fantasy points, third most targets among running backs. And the argument against him seemed to be, oh, Bill Belichick hates to lean on one running back. He's never going to get the work. He's never going to get the work. But so much of best ball for me is going, okay, well, what if he does? What if he does get the work? We've seen him be more explosive. We knew that Damian Harris's touchdowns were likely going to regress. Do you think that this is something Ramondre can sustain going into 2023? Or do you think it's more likely that he comes back to, you know, even by sort of like 20, 30% of his fantasy points? Yeah, I mean, he did get, uh, like, we, as fans, I had so much from Andre. I got it in pretty good getting Damian Harris, like, just consistently couldn't stay healthy. Like, it seemed like he should have just been, like, put on IR, let, like, heal entirely at some point, but they just kept bringing him back. So that part was good. But, like, I do think he proved that there is no reason he can't take on, like, 18 carries four targets five targets a game and they were loading him with targets it wasn't just four or five like in some of these games where like clearly the offense just didn't have like the downfield prowess but was still forced to play from behind and they'll probably be forced to play from behind next year because you're gonna play the bills multiple times bills dolphins and jets should be better like jets can't be worse on offense like just don't play zach wilson it'll be so much better (laughs) so they should play some teams that can put up points once again per usual at this point so there should be plenty of that negative game script Mac Jones just checking it down to good old Ramondre Stevenson. So even, I don't think we'll get, if if Damian Harris plays a full suite of 17 games, I don't think we'll get as many carries per game from Ramondre. Like, they do seem that whenever Damian Harris came back, they were willing to give him upwards of like a dozen touches. But I don't think you necessarily need that. I mean, it depends on where he goes. But he will be like, 
Like uh, if Kareem Hunt also got a ton of carries, something like that. Or, or maybe like, uh, you know, if if Zeke was as good as Tony Pollard type of deal. Or like <laughs> Zeke gets way too much work for how talented he is. But he did get a decent amount of work. Like he scored like 12 touchdowns, right? Or whatever. Like he and, and he if he had gotten like Tony Pollard level pass catching stuff too. Like imagine that type of role, like one on the ground, like one completely through the air and one A, maybe one A plus on the ground. Like when you combine that with how talented he is, like I can see an argument for him being like a, a second round ish pick. I think maybe like he's sort of like Javante where his median he's overpriced for. Maybe, maybe that's something I'm sort of uh, missing. I, I give Ramondre this credit. I'm taking it away from Pollard, but I think maybe Pollard's a little overpriced. It, it's nitpicky, but where his median is overpriced. Like I don't think Javante coming into the season median projected nearly as well as some of the other third round running backs. You probably had to project him for a committee. Not sure how much pass catching work you could give him, but he's so talented that it is very reasonable to say there is a 75th percentile outcome, even 60th percentile, something that's very attainable where he goes out and just absolutely destroys. And it doesn't even have to be related to an injury in his backfield, though that also is baked in. So I, I think I, I'd be willing to bet on Ramondre at least having the potential to do this again if not being far more likely in the upcoming season than it was going into this previous season yeah and the new offensive coordinator with bill o'brien there should definitely be an improvement because it was hard to be any worse than what was going on there another player whose situation is going to change slightly should be chris olave you've got to imagine that the saints are going to bring in a different quarterback this year this year it was really things went from james winston to andy dalton and Chris Olave seemed to be at a cope fine no matter what was going on. Towards the end of the year, he did get quite banged up. But he was the rookie wide receiver too, almost 1,000 yards, 2.25 yards per team pass attempt. And he was brilliant. He seemed like these are the kind of players I love targeting in these kind of rounds, round 8, 9, 10, just picking on those rookies who are maybe going a little under the radar compared to some of the more elite options who are on elite teams. And do you think that Olave can build on this to be – a real wide receiver one next year. We know Michael Thomas is likely out of the building and just any kind of thoughts you've got on how Alave played this year. Yeah, he was awesome. And like, like you read off some of his efficiency metrics. He was so good. He was like the number one rookie in yards per route run. He was one of the better rookies in yards per route run we've seen over the past decade or so. Like, and not only that, like all of these like very, uh, uh, just like, pie in the sky spreadsheet kind of things that are good predictors, but it is kind of hard to uh, see them materialize on the field. He was also really good with both Jameis and Andy Dalton. His like target share and air yard share metrics are almost identical. Like it was like 26% target share and 40, like 40% air yard share with both quarterbacks, almost to a T, which really would dissuade any sort of notion from me that he was just the guy Jameis Winston chucked it deep to, or just Andy Dalton's favorite target. Like he has shown through a myriad of different situations that he is an elite target earner and any upgrade in quarterback play is like directly going to funnel to his production. So he, he's a player like I will be betting on almost. It's like, I'll just let the market beat me. One of these years, people are going to price Olave as the 110, and that will be overpriced. But until <laughs> that happens, like like the mid-round tight ends, like tight ends like 6 or 5 through like 11, have just historically atrocious hit rates. I don't know where the correct price is for those guys. Like, at some point, they would become values. I'll let you guys figure it out. When you figure out what the right price is in three years, you'll finally like beat me in that specific realm. Rookie wide receiver comes in, dominates both in terms of tar like uh, market share metrics and efficiency metrics going into a second year. I'll, you know, you'll outprice me one day, but that's probably not going to happen in 2023. <laughs> well, let's move on to a couple of those tight ends and because this round was very much the story of two different tight ends who hit in different ways. There was TJ Hawkinson, 10.6 points per game, and Dallas got it 9.6 per game. They were both really good in spells, probably better for best ball than for redraft because TJ Hawkinson wasn't overly reliable until he ended up in Minnesota, and Dallas got it had injuries. But these were two really good tight ends. Personally, I'd be quite happy drafting both of these ahead of the likes of Kyle Pitts going into 2023. Do you think that the breakouts that they had were sustainable or do you think that this was just, you know, one of those kind of fluky seasons where everything came together, which we do sometimes see with tight ends? 
Yeah, I, I would say maybe Dallas Goddard's would be less sustainable. He was uh, like off the charts, like literally like twice as good as the next best uh, tight end in terms of yards after the catch per reception. And uh, I can't imagine that's the most stable stat. A lot of these per catch and per target stats aren't particularly stable. Uh, and as you can see, like 5.5 targets per game versus TJ Hawkinson's eight. Like That is a notable discrepancy. And I think Dallas Goddard is great. Another player where like, I think he will outperform baseline efficiency of the average of 32 teams tight ends over his career. Like he's talented. These aren't just names on a spreadsheet, but do I think he can be the best tight end by a country mile in yards after the catch per reception? Probably not. Like he probably would need to earn a higher target share, a higher share of the team's air yards, which he earned like almost none of. They were just using him. And this is part of the reason he was really good in yards after the catch. They were just using him on screens. Like that was where so much of his work came from. So he should based on the types of routes he was running, be good in yards after the catch, but I still don't know if he should be the best tight end by a very significant margin. So I could see his efficiency coming back, whereas TJ Hawkinson, as soon as he stepped in this Minnesota offense, like he's just very clearly their second best receiver. Obviously, he's not listed as a receiver, but in terms of his ability to earn targets and do things with them, already instantly better than Adam Thielen, clearly better than KJ Osborne, better than throwing to the running backs. So to me, like that talent that he showed via the ability to step in play every snap too. like here in a 90% snap share the day he like his first game in Minnesota, which was hilarious. So I think I'd be more willing to bet on TJ Hawkinson, assuming they don't add like significant receiver talent, uh, which I think they should, they really still need to address that. But if the Vikings don't go out and take like around one or two uh, wide receiver, Hawkinson will probably just serve as the de facto wide receiver too, for his team once again, next year. Okay, so they were guys who outplayed their ADP and they did really well for us and definitely helped teams be winning teams and get to the playoffs. Some players who weren't, though, and they're here in fantasy jail. Marcus Velder, Scantling, 7.3 points per game. Kareem Hunt, 7.6 points per game. And Sky Moore, 3.5 points per game. Between them, they combined for five top 24 weeks in their positions. Looking back now, it just feels like There were players here who people were particularly aggressive on. I was in on Marcus Valdez-Scantling. I thought that the Chiefs' Andy Reid was going to scheme him just to fantasy glory. Kareem Hunt, you know, we've seen him be a really productive running back at times. And then Sky Moore seemed like the rookie with all the promise. Do you think there was any bad process in any of these players? Or do you think it was just an unfortunate situation that played out with them all? I don't think Kareem Hunt was particularly bad process. Like the team maybe did flirt with moving on from him, uh, like either via trade or I think possibly cutting him. But uh, like after that didn't happen, like I think there was enough commitment to him that you wanted him as like discount Tony Pollard type of player. Maybe like we still had him a bit over projected for his role, but like it's a bit nitpicky with MBS and sky. Like they, I was saying with Devonta Smith, like I'm not as concerned with the offense because really talented receivers can make the offense better in ways that running backs can't. And they can earn themselves targets. Like targets are so much more earned at the receiver position than carries are at the running back position. Like, MVS uh, had just like never been a target earner throughout his career on a Green Bay team that was desperate for a number two that had been funneling every single one of their touches to Devontae Adams and then no one else like Robert Tunyon popped up out of nowhere. Alan Lazard would pop up, but like no one was consistent. If MVS had been good, uh, he probably would have done something more than like appear once in a box score every six weeks with Aaron Rodgers back to back MVPs as his quarterback. And despite that, I also took a decent amount of MVS because I I got Chiefs pilled in that, oh, t- routes plus Patrick Mahomes is going to go nuclear. And uh, like I, there was a few long catches from MVS, a bunch of fumbled punts from Sky Moore. Juju had a few good games and, and he looked like he was maybe on to something before he had that like pretty bad concussion, it looked like at least. But even then, like he definitely like, there were watching him play. There was never uh, this year's Cooper Cup in the range for Juju, even though yeah. that is what many people said he could be that type of player. So sure, like he had some good spots. I think if he had stayed healthy, maybe he would have outproduced his ADP. But like drafted as a first round receiver next year was second or third even was really never going to happen. And, and that's like going back to the Devonta Smith, really talented. You want to bet on talent to the ability to which we can perceive talent at receiver. 
MVS has never really shown that much talent. I was super in on Sky Moore. He looked talented in college, but he was also uh, what, like a, a Mac wide receiver coming into a not top heavy, but at least a crowded with at least mo- the market money said like MVS should have some ability and he earned routes. Same with Juju, <laughs> like the market as the NFL had some value on these guys. So he was going to need to make some leaps from Mac to NFL and jumping other players to get in. So maybe this is just me like hindsighting. I don't feel as bad about Sky because I do think like there was maybe the potential for him to be talented. But even then, he was definitely overdrafted. Uh, and the same with MVS. I just felt more confident in our data set on MVS being like he is not like a number two caliber receiver. Like he's definitely closer to that, like three, four type of like 30, 40% snap share guy. But yeah, like at receiver, we, as much as I think Patrick Mahomes is great, there are so many different ways for him to funnel targets to other guys. Whereas running back, like you just, there's one running back on the field. If a run is called, he's getting it. And I should have been more personally uh, laser focused in on, despite the fact they have Patrick Mahomes, I didn't think Juju was that good. I didn't think MVS was that good. And I drafted a lot of these guys anyways. Yeah, it was kind of like we all we were all making the arguments for different wide receivers in that Kansas City offense going, oh, okay, well, this is the play, this is the play. And in the end, it just turned out to be a vast majority going to Travis Kelsey and he had an incredible season. But I think all these kind of guys, Kareem Hunt maybe – depending on where he lands next year. He is getting on for a running back, but he is a free agent. But I think Sky Moore and MBS, we're probably talking about like round 12, 13 or so for them next year, which might make them kind of palatable for 2023 best ball. <laughs> Moving on into round nine, Antonio Gibson, Robert Woods, Traylon Burks, Damian Harris, Tyler Lockett, James Cook, Dawson Knox, Devin Singletary, Matthew Stafford, George Pickens, Derek Carr, and Tyler Boyd. This wasn't a bad round at all. I think there was a lot of good players in here, and you can see in the advance rates that we had a bunch of players who advanced well. Antonio Gibson did well after returning punts all season. Tyler Lockett was the standout of this round. Devin Singletary held on to the job long enough. And in terms of fantasy points over expected, apart from Matthew Stafford, who really stunk it up, there weren't too many bad plays. Like you could survive those kind of fantasy points over expected per game. One player who was hands down the best player of this round was Tyler Lockett, who's always undervalued. Wide receiver 12 in total points, nine weeks with over 15 points, and he outperformed DK Metcalf pretty much throughout the season. Do you think there's an argument that those two, their DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, their ADP should be a lot closer together in 2023 best ball than it was this year? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think we love, rightfully so to some degree, to laud DK Metcalf as like the next true breakout receiver. Uh, he's been efficient throughout his career. He's shown the ability to earn targets from the day he was drafted. Uh, and he's giant. And that's also pretty fun. Like, as a short king myself, seeing DK Metcalf out there, I'm like, I want to draft this guy. I'd like to have that guy on my team because Tyler Lockett, I could kind of see eye to eye with him. He's still a little bit taller than me, but if I saw him just out, I'd be like, that guy's ripped, but I also am nearly as tall as him. And I'd rather have the tall guy on my team. But since they have been on the same team, I even I even kind of throw out DK Metcalf's rookie season. Like, I don't expect him to earn targets as at the same level Tyler Lockett did that year. But even since then, they have been flip-flopping target share and air yard share every year. Like one year, DK Metcalf gets a few more deep targets and he ends up having a lead in, in tar- or an air yard share, but Tyler Lockett has more targets. And then the next year, Tyler Lockett ends up being used as more of the deep threat based on the needs of the offense. And in the past two seasons before this, this past year we're coming off of, that had been the case and there wasn't a strong belief other than like DK Metcalf is younger that that would change this season proved that to be more true than ever that like just because DK Metcalf is younger and has been good Tyler Lockett has also been good and showed no signs of slowing that will probably happen at one point eventually but don't have any strong reason to believe it'll be in 2023 yeah, I think if Geno's back, I'll probably end up with a lot more Tyler Lockett than DK Metcalf price pending. A player in the mold of kind of DK Metcalf in terms of he's got that dog in him, George Pickens, 4 to 24 finishes, 11 deep receptions, 4.9 targets per game. It seemed to be the tale of with George Pickens that he was making big plays, but he wasn't really putting up big points. And we got him at a good discount compared to Deontay Johnson, who was kind of riding on the back of 
you know, high target volume from Ben Roethlisberger. But going forward to 2023, I kind of worry that George Pickens might be overdrafted because there just seems to be a real cult status around George Pickens. And how high would you draft him? Bearing in mind that he was in round nine this year and probably didn't give you an awful lot of great weeks for that price. It's, uh, yeah, it can't be that much higher. It's like he did kind of what we expected him to do. He came in, made some big plays. The offense was probably worse than we expected. Yeah, I, like there's a chance the offense is better next year, but like Kenny Pickett was bad. Kenny Pickett just wasn't very good. Uh, they're going to run it back with Matt Canada, offensive coordinator too. So it's it's like, what do we really expect to change? And frankly, the fact that they got some games from Mitchell Trubisky was like a good thing for the offense. Mitch was better by like every metric than Kenny Pickett. Kenny Pickett could make the step next year. Like we see it happen. It could happen again, but he didn't show me anything, you know, other than being inexperienced and now having more experience that would make me believe next year will be the step. Like they'll, I'm sure they'll make some improvements to their offensive line. Maybe Matt Canada will try some different stuff, but like, frankly, he's kind of been the guy we've expected him. Like he's never really changed. Like we gave him some sort of slack because, Oh, well, Ben, Ro it was really the Ben Roethlisberger offense. Like there were some differences in the offense this year, but it, it's hard to even call them better differences. They were just different random stuff that they threw out that didn't really work. So it's round seven or eight, which probably I'm, I'm guessing people go like as high as like six for him. And he also kind of ran good to the degree to which Deontay Johnson was atrocious. Uh, like if Deontay Johnson is better than like five yards per target or scores some touchdowns, one score, one touchdown, that's one touchdown that would have come off the board for George Pickens, but he didn't score a single one. So like in a season in which Deontay scores five if he could somehow reach such a high margin that could very well come out of the already thin bottom line of pickens i think if you're betting on pickens you have to have been and continue to be a, a kenny pickett uh defender which is fine like i don't think he's bad coming out of college i think it was good but like he was worse than i expected he could be better than that if you think he's better than that you should be comfortable taking pickens a little ahead of adp i don't have that much faith in him though and i would rather bet on Deontay Johnson's ability to just raw earn targets, brute force your way to decent fantasy finishes. Maybe he does better uh, after the catch or at the point where you have to make the catch or getting into the end zone. If any of those things improve, we get a little bit better of a season out of Deontay. Uh, the, the path for Pickens to improve lies so much on his quarterback that I'm a little less excited. Yeah, I think there has to be some positive touchdown regression for Kenny Pickett. It just like... It, the only way is up, like when you're at the bottom. Um, and in terms of Deontay Johnson, he's somebody, their cost will be very interesting because if they end up very close together, I'd probably feel like taking Deontay Johnson more. Another tandem who are kind of tightly linked, James Cook and Devin Singletary were both in this round. Devin Singletary, he'd never really given us amazing seasons. But this year, he was pretty usable. He had 10.5 points per game compared to James Cook, who had 5.9 points per game. And every time that James Cook seemed to have a good performance, the rug would get pulled and it'd be back to, you'd play him in DFS for next week and then he'd be riding the pine for the whole game. Do you think that the ADP kind of got this one right for the whole? Because obviously we were, anyone drafting James Cook was hoping for that big breakout down the stretch. But do you think it was kind of a fair price to pay for these running backs? Yeah, I think maybe the most you could argue is they were both a little overpriced because Buffalo has zero desire to run the football. And when they do run the football, sometimes with their quarterback and when they're in the end zone or near the end zone, they love to run the football with their quarterback. So maybe you can make your argument that like neither of them were great prices. But I do think like we kind of got pretty reasonable outcomes from them. Devin Singletary, not very efficient. They seem to like him. James Cook seemed to be the better running back. They didn't give him the ball much. That's about what we expected. I think if James Cook had gone out, earned a larger role, and been really explosive on that, that also could have been expected. If Devin Singletary had even pushed him for a few more carries, had Devin Singletary really shut him out? Like, these were all, like, within, like, less than one standard deviation of what was expected. So, it'll be interesting to see. I think Devin Singletary, I believe, is a free agent. I would not be surprised if people just go through the moon to get James Cook and, like, 
Zach Moss is brought back or whatever. Like the true, the most <laughs> heinous thing you can think. <laughs> like Duke Johnson from the practice squad. They sign him to reserve future contract. They call him up from the practice squad in week three, and he's getting 12 touches a game by week eight. Like, I don't I don't know if James Cook profiles as the type of guy I would really love to see him be, and I don't know if we will accept that as a price by his ADP. Like, we really do get enamored with these, like, low-volume, high-efficiency backs and just projecting them into 250 touches. Yeah, and it seems like the Bills aren't even settled on what they've got running back. We saw them linked with Christian McCaffrey. They seemed enamored with the idea of this elite pass catching running back who they could then not throw the ball to so you know they went out and got Naeem Hines in a trade and then didn't throw the ball to him didn't even use him so I wouldn't be surprised if they added somebody else but I, equally I I wouldn't be surprised if in early best ball drafts right now James Cook's probably going in that sort of round five area moving on to round 10 Corderell Patterson, Chase Claypool, Zach Ertz, Aaron Rodgers, Rondell Moore, Kenneth Walker, Melvin Gordon, Garrett Wilson, Kirk Cousins, Julio Jones, Cole Komet, and Jalen Tolbert. This was a round where there was a lot of, there was some good and there was a lot of bad. Uh, you can see on the advance rates there, we've got a bunch of players in the red, orange, which is right around the average, and then the players in green. In terms of fantasy points over expected, this was a real minefield. There were a lot of players here who didn't give you their ceiling outcomes. The only players who really did was Patterson, but he didn't stay healthy, and then things tailed off towards the end of the season. Kenneth Walker, who hit the wall, and then Cole Komet, who a lot of his performances were buoyed up by those big games. But Garrett Wilson really felt like he broke out, despite having atrocious quarterback situations. He was the rookie wide receiver one. He wasn't drafted there. I think he was drafted as the wide receiver three, maybe even four. And he did feel slightly undervalued in some ways because of his sheer talent. What were your thoughts on his season? And let's just play the hypothetical. If Aaron Rodgers lands in New York, how don't, early... Don't say these beautiful things to me. Another <laughs> one, like Garrett Wilson, like I know at some point there would be a price that's too high to pay for Garrett Wilson. Like that is just how, like at some point he will score fewer points than just Jefferson, but I know the market won't price him there. I know they won't price him particularly close. And I know that he is extremely talented and will get an incredible situation upgrade. I assume there is just no way they attempt to run it back. I, another one, I would just let the market beat me. You, you could throw out any ADP you want. I'm probably just going to tell you, I think the market has been lower than the has been, under what they should be on these players historically. We've seen wide receivers and especially young wide receivers really rise up on underdog. Maybe by the end of the summer, he really, his price has adjusted. But like, I'd be shocked if one, his ADP uh, in early best ball is not, uh, barring quarterback situation, let's just say that holds constant or whatever, or it, it we price in about what ends up happening. I would be almost shocked if he is not just higher in August than he is in uh, April or whatever, because he's the type of player that we love to pump up. And I still think like the, the, maybe the August ADP, the September 1st ADP, maybe that is a point in which I'm not taking a ton of him, but I'm guessing he opens as a player. I am getting a lot of, like you said, he was the best rookie receiver in terms of overall production. He had dominant target share and air yard shares. Uh, even if they bring in competition for targets, I think that's clearly going to come out of a guy like Corey Davis or Elijah Moore because those guys, Corey Davis is a fine veteran type of player. Elijah Moore, they just don't seem to like very much or don't seem to play very much. Like they literally played at one point Denzel Mims over him. They hate Denzel Mims. So uh, uh, Garrett Wilson's season was awesome. If he gets Aaron Rodgers, uh, I'm really excited for Aaron Rodgers to throw a bunch of passes to Braxton Barrios because he just vibes with Barrios or whatever. I don't know. Uh, Garrett Wilson's yeah, so, great. I'm going to have a lot of him. So his current ADP on early underdog best ball drafts is 30. He's the wide receiver 13. So he's kind of out in that early third round point. And that feels pretty palatable to me. Yeah, I uh, feel like I could push him. You could argue as high as like wide receiver 10. Like his, I think 13 seems like a very reasonable median projection. We don't know what the quarterback play is going to be. But it, again, it just can't be as bad as it was last year. He <laughs> dominated targets in air yards, like was great in both those metrics. So pie is getting better. His cut of the pie is great. 13 feels fair, if not a little light, a little light. It, it's, yeah. you know, it's up there, but I could go as high as 10 and he'll probably get to 10 by July or whatever. But until then, go for it. 
Let's move on to hopefully his future quarterback, Aaron Rodgers. This is one of his worst seasons in the NFL. Like his lowest passing yardage since 2017, most interceptions since 2008. Career low, 14.3 fantasy points per game. I think he only crossed the 20 point threshold maybe once all season, if at all. And if you drafted him thinking that you were going to get another MVP season out of him, you were sorely disappointed. Do you think that this is the signs of real decline for Aaron Rodgers going forward? Or do you think it was just Green Bay put him in a difficult situation to succeed this year? I mean, like, what is he, like 38 years old now or something like that? He's, like, pretty old. But I will say physically, I like watching him. He looked mostly there, still able to make pretty much all of the throws. I do think, like, to some degree, he was just kind of checked out. Like, he was I, not even missing throws, just, like, missing guys who were open, probably because, like, he sees uh, Amari Rogers, who eventually would be cut, uh, line up out wide. And he's like, I'm not going to look out to the right side of the field on this play. How about that? Uh, so I think in a better situation, he definitely does better. He literally did not top 300 yards in a single game. And he threw three touchdowns once. Like, no ceiling, no floor, especially because he threw more interceptions, like you said, more interceptions than we'd ever seen by a mile. So... I think things will be better, but do I want to be betting on quarterback changing teams coming off a bad season at his high 30s? Like, he seems like hype that I could end up fading relatively quickly. Okay, so another player who had a bad season, Jalen Tolbert. He was drafted as a wide receiver 55, going here in round 10. He had three targets all season, two receptions and 12 receiving yards. He finished as the wide receiver 200. It just feels like there's no argument against it, but it was bad process that led Jalen Tolbert to being drafted so high. Michael Gallup was injured, but it never really sounded like the team were overly effusive about him. I think people just got caught a little too high on the rookie hype there and thinking, well, someone will have to catch it, when in reality there was Pollard, there was Schultz, and there was C.D. Lamb, and there was enough options that Dak didn't have to throw to a rookie running a rookie wide receiver who wasn't that elite coming out of college. Yeah. If I recall correctly, like there's like a little bit of hype at like mini camps or whatever, voluntary rookie uh, workouts or whatever. Uh, oh, this guy can make some plays. And then almost as soon as I got into training camp, it was like, Oh no, this is not going well. This is uh, he is not going to be on the field much this year. And that was right. And I think it's hard to draw much from optimism that coaches give because it's sort of easy to give out. They do it a lot. But when coaches or even just uh, like people on the ground beat reporters for the team are very clearly pessimistic about a player, that probably has more signal than like just sort of vapid optimism does. And it was very clear here. Like you said, he was a third year, I believe, breakout at South Alabama. Is that right? I think it was South Alabama. Third year breakout at South Alabama trying to come into the NFL right away, like was not as good. Of, like we saw it with Sky Moore. Like Sky Moore was unable to get on the field. He was making a very large leap from low level division one competition to the best competition in the world. And Jalen Tolbert was less good of a prospect than that. Also trying to make a similar leap. And he was supposedly having a not good training camp. Like this feels a bit foreseeable. This yeah. is, I mean, truly maybe two catches is a bit less than foreseeable, <laughs> but yeah. not having a good season. I, I guess the one interesting thing is though, his advance rate was like eyeballing it 11%. The media, the, you know, the average is what 16 point something. I think that, like, I guess maybe one takeaway here, like Zach Ertz didn't play uh, a bunch of the season and had a 15% advance rate. Julio Jones, uh, Julio Jones did nothing and had a 12 and a half or 13% advance rate. No matter how horribly you do in this round, it appears as though we have, at least at this point, reached a point where, like, I mean, Jalen Tolbert is literally a zero. I, I, yeah, did not there anything. were no usable weeks, uh, none, and it's, none. that's it. It's like we're at the point in the drafts now where you can carry bad players. I mean, I yeah. had a bunch of teams that advanced into the playoffs with Trey Lance as their only quarterback when Lamar Jackson had been injured and stuff. So it, it's not the same sort of hammer blow that it can be 
earlier on. Um, the one player whose advance rate was really high was Kenneth Walker. Really seemed to hit the rookie wall, though. Between weeks one to nine, he had 4.5 missed tackles per game, and that dropped to 2.6 for the rest of the season. Big run percentage dropped from 9% down to 5. Touchdown rate dropped from 6.3 down to 2.3. Do you think it was just a case of a rookie wall, or do you think that he just didn't have the legs to be a workhorse running back? Yeah, he was a little injured down the stretch, and even when he'd come back, it was like unclear. Like I think the first game he came back from injury, they didn't use him as a receiver at all, or at least they didn't use him on routes at all, which he had finally worked his way up to. But then they started giving him routes again later in the season, like in the final two or three weeks. The offense didn't look nearly as good in the second half of the season as it did in the first. They didn't look nearly as good in like the second half of games, frankly. So I think like sure the if you split it to like his early and later half it looks like he slowed down and to some degree he did he was banged up it was his first nfl season but there were a lot of factors outside of his control i mean they were just losing more games down the stretch quarterback play wasn't as good uh I, like i thought it was still a really impressive season i believe rashad yeah. penny was on a one-year deal if i remember That's right yeah sounds right so and i can't imagine they bring him back this like was a really positive indicator. I think the only negative takeaway you could have from this season for him is that the offense seemed to get figured out a bit in the second half, but they weren't atrocious, right? They didn't fall off the map. They just weren't, you know, <laughs> early in the season, Geno Smith was like breaking the CPOE metrics. Like he was looking yeah. like the most accurate quarterback in the NFL. That regressed a bit. And I think that is reasonable to expect to regress, but the offense still looked decent in the second half. And can they not find ways to improve on that second half to, inch towards the first half probably so i think even if yeah the second half of the season you didn't get quite as much as you had hoped based on how incredible he was in weeks like what you know six through ten or whatever uh yeah. i still think it was a really strong indicator from walker definitely okay let's jump over around 11 daryl henson josh palmer brian robinson russell gage romeo and dobbs Rashad White, Naeem Hines, Kenneth Gainwell, Devontae Parker, McCall Hardman, Michael Gallup, and Justin Fields. Justin Fields absolutely saved this round. There's a lot of bad in this round. And, you know, this is what we kind of expect. When you get to this point in the draft, you're draft, drafting a lot of players with question marks over them. And Justin Fields had question marks over him, which is why he was here rather than higher up. Um, but in terms of fantasy points over expected, you can see the standouts here with McCall Hardman and uh, Justin Fields. And his season was incredible. Finish, you know, he was a QB5, 296 fantasy points, eight top seven finishes, 94 rushing yards per game between weeks six to 17. But he was 56 in passing EPA amongst 57 quarterbacks with 50 or more dropbacks, which that's not good. That's just, we'll sum it up quite easily like that. Do you think that Justin Fields can make a jump with his passing game? like he did with his kind of rushing game because his rushing game this year was way better than it was in his rookie season. Yeah, I think so. And like, he like clearly has the physical talent to do it. Like he made some deep throws. Uh, I coincidentally watched a lot of bears games this year. Uh, I'm going to blame that one on Roto Pat for assigning me bears games a lot, but uh, at least, you know, they played the lions that one time. That was fun. And uh, Justin Fields can make throws at all levels of the field. Like he has the physical talent to do it. We have seen him do it in very sporadic instances. And we know that he is, I mean, he is the best, like he already has a really strong argument to be the best running quarterback the NFL has ever seen. He was on pace for the best season for missing like two out of his final five or six games. Uh, if you want to say Michael Vick was better and he is the number two, like he had one of, the best rushing seasons ever for a quarterback. Like he will, uh, like he's already tied for like third in 100 yard games among quarterbacks career <laughs> lifetime. Like he will project for 1100 plus yards on the ground. Once you get him to a full 17 games. And once you get the offense to be more efficient by, I don't know, adding talent on the offensive line, <laughs> adding talent at receiver, not spending the first half of the season, not using him on design runs for like the first six or seven weeks. They weren't even using him to his fullest potential. Even if you say his potential is only as a runner, I don't think that's the case, but if you 
like, oh, he just doesn't have it as a passer. That's fine. They didn't use him effectively as a runner early in the season. It wasn't until like they had a, like a week six. Oh, they, it wasn't a bye week. It was a Thursday they had, night game. Yeah. They had, yes, the mini bye where either Eberflus or the OC said like, oh, we looked at like, I think they, they said like old Deshaun Watson tape. And it was, like, it was old Ravens tape. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, it was old Ravens tape. And, and like, did you not think about that? <laughs> You have the summer is so long. You have so many times at which you could have done this and you get like the extra Saturday, Sunday off. And you're like, now that I think about it, this Justin Fields guy can really run the football. Like imagine if they had done it in the first half, he averaged like over a hundred yards from something like weeks. Uh, I mean, you have a six seventeen. he averaged 95 yards. Like, that's he, he a lot been. of yards over 17 weeks. He could have easily been QB three or so. It was very, like I reached a point where I kind of boiled over with it, and I went on after that Thursday night game over here in the UK. I get up and watch the games on a Friday morning, and I was infuriated by it. I was like, "This isn't how to use Justin Fields," and I was ranting about how bad he was and how bad the whole the whole offense was. And then, of course, everything turns around, and I start looking like an idiot very soon. Another player who had a kind of difficult first season perhaps brian robinson i mean he looked like a man recovering from being shot he was only second in fantasy points per touch out of 73 running backs with 50 touches or more but he did have 66 rushing yards per game which was the 14th most among running backs do you think that there's an upside case of brian robinson going into 2023 where he's not recovering from being shot and where he probably has a large workload from the get-go yeah, I think my only, like, really, the, the reason I have a difficult time see him, seeing him be more than, like, the RB20, like, six in a good season is that uh, they they seem to have really no inclination. I guess they actually did give him some routes. They never, hardly ever gave Antonio Gibson an 80% route share. Brian Robinson would pitch in for, like, a dozen-plus routes in games. He just did nothing. Like, he was just a, a no-value add on his routes. It was just catch and fall down, catch and go for negative yards, like, So even if he were to get more routes, it doesn't really seem to me like that would result in more production or at least a meaningful amount of more production. So realistically, he is a between the tackles banger on a team that like I have no clue what their plan is at quarterback. They're at a point in the draft where they're not going to get like a quarterback, I'm sure, or I at least have a strong belief, probably maybe things change, but they're probably not getting a quarterback. I have a strong belief in as a rookie. So I project this to be a bad offense. That's going to lose two times. The Eagles lose two times. The Cowboys per season, like uh, the Brian Robinson story is great. It just happens to be that the way we play fantasy doesn't reward what he's going to do, which he is going to grind out 60 some odd yards per game. Like he did last year, maybe even more, but he's probably not going to score touchdowns and catch passes. And we care about that for fantasy. I, I don't think he's doing that. Yeah. I think it was just, This team probably just needs a complete clean sweep from everything once new ownership come in. Another running back who he definitely had the opportunity as well, Rashad White, but never really made the job his own. Now that Tom Brady's most likely out of Tampa and Leonard Fournette can be easily moved on, he's got a couple of years left on his deal, but it's very easy for him to cut him. After what we saw from Rashad White in 2022, do you have any trepidation about how high Rashad White could be drafted in 2023? I do really want to draft Rashad White. But <laughs> but too. the thing is, uh, like I, I took a ton of him last year. feel yeah. pretty decent about how it went, uh, all things considered. But he was like no better than Leonard Fournette between the tackles, their offensive line. If like it depends on what happens with Brady. I don't think he stays probably. I don't think he wants to run it back with this iteration of the roster. But like what I how did they, they're not going to upgrade? I was gonna say, how do they upgrade? They're not gonna upgrade on Brady. They maybe go for Derek Carr and it's not as big of a downgrade as we think. And we're pleasantly surprised that they skate through in the NFC South again or whatever. But the offense almost certainly is going to get worse. They haven't been able to invest in their offensive line because they've been spending a ton of money uh, on just keeping the players they currently have, which hasn't been as much on the offensive line. So I I think they'll have uh, average at best offensive line, probably below average quarterback play like the reason a guy like Derek Carr is available is because his previous team saw him for a bunch of years and said nope don't don't want that he wasn't like particularly good in like CPUE or EPA either so 
they're probably going to get below average quarterback play, average below average offensive line play. We saw uh, in these or better circumstances this past year, he wasn't particularly efficient between the tackles. He's really good as a receiver out of the backfield. And if Fournette is gone, which does seem possible, if not likely, uh, that's a lot of work to go around. I think I'm still going to take him. It's, it's not an easy one to talk yourself. Into he's going to be a three yeah. down back. And that's so much of what I care about. And he's going to be probably inefficient and I'll get what I deserve. Like I'm probably <laughs> going to take him because I like him, even though um, I mean, I guess the, the one thing is he really could push for 300 touches, like 50 catches yeah. as a rookie. Plus the entirety of the backfield of Fournette is gone. So much of what I care about running back is touches. He's going to have those. Though in terms of him out producing his like per especially carry efficiency, the deck will be stacked against him. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to round twelve, our final round of this part. We've got Jahan Dotson, Alexander Madison, Tua Tagovailoa, Pat Fryermuth, Isaiah McKenzie, James Robinson, Albert O, DJ Chark, Isaiah Pacheco, Trevor Lawrence, Michael Carter, and Irv Smith. This round was really good. You can see there's just fields of green there. There were lots of players here who outperformed players in the rounds ahead of them, which helped push up their advance rates. And there weren't really too many bad picks here. Irv Smith did badly and Alexander Madison and Albert O. But there were a lot of players who were scoring positive fantasy points over expected or slightly negative, but not to the point where it really killed your team because, you know, you're deep into the draft at this point. Jahan Dotson, though, is someone for me who I feel like he had as good a season as a lot of the rookie wide receivers, but he's not really getting the hype. 5.2 targets per game, 14 yards per reception, 3.5 fantasy points per touch. And he did seem to have some really explosive weeks, but in best ball, that's completely okay. I imagine in redraft or dynasty, he was probably a bit of a headache, but is he somebody that profiles really well for best ball next year? Or do you think there's too many quarterback question marks to really heavily target him? Yeah, there's quarterback question marks. He like his role probably doesn't have a ton of room to grow. He was pretty consistently playing like 80 plus percent snaps had like a good route rate uh, he caught a lot of touchdowns, which that's very good in the sense of, I think, good players catch touchdowns. But do I think in these circumstances, does he average seven touchdowns a season if we run this season out a bunch of times? Probably not. Uh, and do I think next year things will be much better? Probably not. He was pretty weak in yards per route run because he ran a bunch of routes, but didn't like have an incredible season. So I think with all of that, I, I think essentially his touchdowns will over inflate the lack of like per route efficiency and per route ability to draw targets. He will have strong ish competition for targets. Really. You can't afford that much competition for targets. If your quarterback is going to be whom like Sam Howell or whatever, like whatever they decide to do, it will not be pretty probably. So, uh, I think maybe his lack of efficiency in terms of like a route basis and his over efficiency in terms of things that aren't as sticky, like uh, touchdowns will maybe outprice him for me relative to other people. But I still think like it was a good enough season for a real life rookie uh, perspective that he will continue to be on the field and like probably a player I'd be more interested in having over the long term in dynasty than I think the one year window in 2023 will be. Here's a quick hypothetical for you. Would you take him ahead of Christian Watson in no. best ball if you were drafting early best ball? Right well, uh, Aaron Rodgers isn't going to be there, so maybe I would. I don't know. I don't think yeah. I would. Uh, okay. And I, I think also Christian Watson uh, massively outperformed, obviously, his touchdown uh, efficiency. Yeah. But I, I think there is room for his role to grow, and we uh, – like. I would rather bet on a good player being able to play more and earn more targets than, than a supposedly good player last year who played on all the wide receiver or on the two receiver sets. Like he was playing over Curtis Samuel. He just has to be more efficient as a player. Whereas uh, we saw, like we can see through last year that Christian Watson can be less efficient, but if he gets on the field more uh, and like, there's also, I was kind of a reason he wasn't on the field because he was a raw prospect. He's also hurt at the start of the year, then hurt again later in the year. So I don't think like, like, yeah, I think running more routes as a rookie is probably a good thing. Like you want to be on the field more. <laughs> and in that aspect, Jahan Dotson was better than Christian Watson. He was on the field more, both on a per game basis and, and in 
total. But like, okay. there's a degree to which Christian Watson is just better, right? I'm not crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I feel that. I, I definitely understand that. So talking about quarterback play, we'll lump these two in together. Two attack of Iola, six 18-plus point games, QB2 in passing EPA, 8.9 yards per attempt, which led all quarterbacks. And then Trevor Lawrence, who really broke out for the second part of the season, you know, between weeks 12 and 17, QB5 with 20.7 points per game, 33.7 fantasy points over expected, and he was third in EPA. So do you think we should have been more expecting these breakouts to happen going into the year? We knew that Tua got a more offensive-minded coach, and he got Tyree Kill as well as having Jalen Waddle. And as for Trevor Lawrence, he didn't have somebody who was going to kick him if he did things that were bad. So should we have been higher on these than the likes of Tom Brady and Matthew Stafford who went ahead of them? Yeah, yeah, we definitely should have. This isn't uh, hindsight. Like both these players were getting situational overhauls, the likes to which, especially like to uh, like the likes to which we had never seen. Like he had had, I don't want to say it was like a terrible offensive setup, but he was going from a so-so offensive setup that team actually uh, in 2021 did some stuff to help him out they actually ran like a ton of rpo gave him some easy layups but they weren't giving him i mean they weren't giving him tyree kill first of all but they weren't using jalen waddle as much as a deep threat either they were not giving him as much like easy stuff over the middle of the field it's also easy when you have tyree kill and jalen waddle <laughs> but they were also uh just getting an overall scheme upgrade that is hard i mean it's really hard to quantify but it was clear. Like we knew it was an upgrade. It was just to what degree. And we knew Tyreek Hill is an upgrade. It's just how much, uh, you know, how much of Tyreek Hill in Kansas City was that. So, yeah, I, I think it probably made sense, especially for uh, maybe like someone like Brady, who at least Stafford was coming off of just an incredible season. Brady was coming off of a good season, but like wasn't as good as the year before that. I don't know. Yeah. Like, I think maybe we should have. And Trevor Lawrence, as much as he didn't get like, the Tyree kill upgrade. He got a good depth, like upgrade getting Christian Kirk and Zay Jones. Like neither of those players, yeah. maybe even summation are worth Tyree kill, but it is a meaningful difference. And it is like, I, I always have to go back and look at how mind bogglingly bad the urban Meyer era <laughs> was like, there was so basic stuff. I think it was um, a QB sneak where in a post-game press conference, Urban Meyer is like, yeah, he doesn't know how to run QB sneak. We haven't worked on that yet. And like later in the day or the next practice, Trevor Lawrence is like, yeah, of course I know how to run a QB sneak. Like the most basic stuff. Like you said, he kicked a player. Like, so it was more of a, an environmental change for him. Of course, he did get, uh, you know, better weapons. But Urban Meyer was terrible. Just an absolute dolt. And Doug Peterson's had a ton of success in the NFL and he left his previous team what seemed to be more of like power struggle philosophical accords. I mean, it's for sure. It seems to me that is not that is exactly what happened. There's no speculation. It was more of the power struggle between him and ownership and these philosophical differences. The on field product for him for what he had was obviously very good. So, yeah, I think this is like an easy bet to make, especially even with Trevor Lawrence, where uh, like Tua, we did have like a reasonable data sample that said he wasn't that good. There was a sample in college that said he was really good. So there was still hope there. The only sample we had of Trevor Lawrence in the NFL was so marred by his terrible coaching staff that it almost felt reasonable to throw it out. And then you look back at his college college sample and he's incredible again. So both of them we should have bet on. I almost feel a little more comfortable betting on Trevor Lawrence, though, in, in hindsight. Yeah, um, one player who a lot of people bet on and didn't pay off was mm -hmm. Albert O. I, again, oh. another another inmate in fantasy jail, 10 catches for 95 yards. He was only active for six games. But then at the end of the season, once Nathaniel Hackett was out of there, Jerry Rosberg made him active on game days after Greg Dulcich was injured. And of all of a sudden, there was just enough Albert O where people can be like, I knew I was right. If he if he'd been on the field all season, he <laughs> no, we off. were not right. As, as the biggest Albert O slappy in the world, I hate to say it, guys. I think we were wrong about this. Uh, and yeah, it was a little fun consolation to see him get like he got six targets in week seventeen. He was on the field a bunch in week eighteen, a bunch for his standards. It's a bunch. It was just under half the snaps. Didn't even catch his only target. Uh, and yeah, they had a bad coaching staff. But do I think the coaching staff is smart enough to like discern the difference between a player who should not be brought on game day and a player who should play a bunch of snaps? Like 
Maybe they get the nuances a little wrong. Maybe they should have kept Albert O active and taken Eric Saubert out of the lineup. Sure. Maybe that's the level of degree to which they missed on him, but they see him every day. They knew he was not good. And they told us this when they played him into like the fourth quarter of that final preseason game. And um, I didn't draft him after that. So I got down to like 90% Albert O after uh, that's pretty taking good. That's respectful. all summer. The uh, process was good. Yeah, the process, <laughs> uh, simply put, we must trust it. Um, I mean, yeah, like they told us he was not good uh, in the preseason. And as much as I thought he was pretty good, uh, he had been good in college, but had only ever produced on a relatively small sample in the NFL. And not only that, but I also kind of think that had the Broncos offense been better, like say he goes out and has a really good start. Uh, Russell Wilson's throwing dimes, two touchdowns to Albert O, long one to Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler down the sideline. Like maybe he does get more playing time to me. Like Albert O was bad, but maybe betting on the Broncos was worse. Yeah, and I don't think that it really killed you because the way that you took Albert O, unless you took him in two tight end builds with, say, Mark Andrews, you yeah. probably were taking him in three tight end builds and you can live with that from a tight end. I mean, you do have to bet on upside at some point. So that's kind of it for round seven to 12. You can see here kind of the highlights really were round 12 and then round seven. In between, there were some pretty difficult rounds. Advance rate on everything. Of course, we do want players getting into the playoffs who aren't on an awful lot of teams, but Kyle... like Albert O, like Albert O. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Looking back at the long, hot best ball summer now and thinking about these rounds in particular, is there any kind of global takeaways you've got before I let you get out of here? Yeah. The one thing I did, I, I briefly brought it up was that like Jalen Tolbert, I'm sure I, I didn't see Albert O's, but I'm sure Albert O's advance rates like weren't terrible uh, for how bad they were. They were below average by below expected by like 5%, which is chunky. Like that is a big chunk uh, of advance rates because it's cutting it by a third or whatever about, uh, but you could probably afford to take some pretty decent swings here. Uh, especially if you're like understanding the difference between, like you said, Albert O three tight end advance rates are probably much better than they were in two tight end advance rates. And it especially depends on what players you had that what other tight end or what other two tight ends you had. So you can probably afford to take some smart swings in these rounds uh, because one, like the advance rates were just kind of bad <laughs> overall. Uh, and two, they were blanket uh, for the most part below average uh, in these rounds, but no one, no one killed you. Uh, you know, I'm guessing beyond like round seven or eight, maybe even then though, no one truly killed you. Dalen Tolbert did nothing, literally nothing, no usable weeks. And he had a, an advance rate about a third or uh, two thirds of what you would expect. You can probably afford to take some swings, be a little unique in these rounds. Uh, and if you're doing it smartly, like we talked about with like Albert O tight end builds. That's it. And the next great part of this off season will be getting all the win rates when places like four for four and wrote of his of their tools with, uh, and we can really dive into what was the right way to take a player and what was the wrong way to take a player. But Kyle, that's it. Thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate you doing this, people. If you're here, you should be following Kyle already. He's on Twitter at, at Kyle Tweets here. Uh, Kyle, is there anything you'd like to plug? No, check out the uh, Roto World Football Show. That's the next thing I got coming up. I'm working on off-season stuff already, which won't, you know, there's some time to wait for that. So just check out the show. Brilliant. And thanks, everybody. Please like and subscribe. Leave a comment. Tell us which players you hit on. And tune in next week for part three when we'll be discussing rounds 13 through 18. And there are some stinkers and some real values there. 